uh, near lines. Um, if you have, let's say, an emergency situation, a scenario where you have, let's say, a hydraulic systems failure, and, uh, you know, do you hand over the controls to your FO, the exchange controls with the FO, and do you take over the uh, quick reference handbook and begin the emergency procedure uh, uh, and do assessment and do aeronautical decision making? Is that, uh, what, what is your thoughts on that? How is that done? Well, Babic, thank you very much. Because that really hits home one of the things that Aerostar wants to bring to the table with training young men and women to be able to take them from zero time up through airline placement ready. In that building block of learning, we learn different things at different times that apply to the aircraft and the situation we're in. For example, as a uh, solo pilot uh, out flying a single engine aircraft, I am using checklists as read and do lists. That's because I'm flying by myself. In the airlines, we use checklists in multiple different ways. Our normal operations are um, what I would call a um, uh, check and balance system where one pilot is reading the challenge the other pilot is giving the response but both pilots are verifying the correct switch position so it's a triple check however during an abnormal or emergency situation we now need to have a clear delegation of duties and responsibilities our number one safety related item is to fly the aircraft. So one pilot is going to be designated to fly the airplane. That leaves the other pilot delegated to deal with running the checklist, handling the abnormal situation, and controlling the radio responses. Now the checklist becomes like we do it in a single engine uh, general aviation aircraft, it becomes a self read and do. Because we're independently running the checklist ourselves. So now I'm going to read it and it says XYZ switch off. And then I'm going to take the switch off. That way the pilot flying doesn't get distracted, stays focused on the primary responsibility of controlling the aircraft while the other pilot deals with the abnormal emergency procedures and checklists. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And is that part of uh, what you guys call CRM? I think in the broader sense, CRM is a pretty encompassing term, right? It's how we work together, how we structure everything we do together is CRM. Uh, so yes, it falls under the category of CRM. It falls under the category of air crew decision making. But it's acknowledging that there are clear, defined duties and roles and applying those duties and roles at the appropriate time to meet the nature of the emergency that's uh, being dealt with. You know, it's really interesting if you look at the medical profession. I just recently read that by comparison to the airline uh, operations, the number of accidents and incidences that we have is one in millions of operations. If you look at the medical profession, and of course it's an unfair comparison, but the accident incident failure fatality rate is much higher. Why? Because we have created this methodical check and balance system that we call threat and error management. And it's part of a greater process to assure that we trap mistakes, we learn from mistakes, so that we never get into an unsafe uh, situation or the aircraft is never in a uh, unsafe state. And uh, taking into consideration the information you provided us just now, the scenarios we discussed, 
what do you think would be best for uh, airline transport pilot candidates in a simulator uh, and type rating basically for Airbus 320 or the Boeing 737? What qualifications would you recommend for them to work on prior to coming over here and uh, basically working with us? What would be, uh, what would, let's put it this way, what would uh, best ensure their success in completing the programs? Well, first I'd like to acknowledge that a type rating in any transport category jet is very challenging. Uh, I've heard the analogy that it's like taking a sip out of a fire hose. So you want to come with a mindset that your focus is going to be on completing the type rating uh, program. You want to be 100% dedicated with both your time and resources uh, while you're in training to accomplish that goal. You can certainly uh, help yourself out by pre-studying. The manuals uh, on how to fly the aircraft are typically available through the school here at Aerostar. We have it available to post online. Uh, we have the ability to send it to you. But a lot of materials are also available uh, just by doing a Google search. Now I caution that. When I say materials, I'm not referring to YouTube I'm not referring to some of the um, airline specific the stuff that's out there. We train as most 142 training schools do the manufacturers recommended procedures. So I would go and research and look at those procedures. It's a little bit different than learning how to fly a single engine airplane. And the difference is that crew dynamic and the way we integrate flows procedures, call-outs into how we fly the airplane. So when I was flying a Cessna 172, you're very much interactive with the aircraft. You feel the airplane, you hear the changes in noise. It's a, it's a very uh, engaged type of flying. When you go to fly an airliner, you're flying an airplane that could be 170, 180,000, even 200,000 pound uh, airplane, and I'm talking about the narrow body Boeing and Airbus aircraft. You don't have as much tactile response. The A320, for example, is a fly by wire system, so you're not going to get the feel of acceleration, deceleration through the flight controls that you would uh, in a Cessna airplane. Uh, the uh, Boeing 737 is hydraulically boosted. So the flight controls, although cable, they're only cable back to hydraulic boost controls that are actually manipulating the very large surfaces that are under a lot of aerodynamic loads. What that translates to is we're learning to fly the airplane by science. We fly airliners by very specific pitch and power and configuration settings. We fly by science. We always bring the flaps up at exactly the same time in our sequence of events. Everything is very scripted. So when you think about being scripted, I've used the analogy a lot. It's not unlike being an actor who is getting ready to perform a play. Do you ever see how actors or actresses are uh, practicing or studying they have their scene all written out for them. And in that scene, it has their script of what they're going to say and the actions of what they're going to do, very much like we do in the airlines. You see, what most people don't realize is in airline flying, everything we say and do is scripted below 10,000 feet. So during the critical phases of flight, we are saying, scripted phrases only. In fact, if we say anything other than what's scripted, we're going to be challenged by our coworker. What does that mean? Why are you saying that? Part of the reason is, is because we want to reduce ambiguity. We want to make sure that there are no barriers to communication. The other issue is, 
in my airline, for example, we might have 10,000 pilots. I may never fly with the same first officer on more than one trip at a time. But we have to make sure that when we do fly together, we pull off the exact same operation exactly the same. The procedures, everything is done precisely. So as you're learning to fly the airplane, an Airbus or a Boeing, you have your, your script, your scene. And you're learning the things that you have to say, when they say, when they're meant to be said, what your fellow actor or actress is going to say in response, your first officer, your captain, your ground crew, your flight attendants. There's lots of players in this uh, script. And it's going to tell you what actions to take in the exact order and the exact sequence of phase of flight that they have to be done. It's really uh, super exciting. It's fun. Um, but it is a different way of thinking from how we learn how to fly general aviation. I think of those uh, scripts that you were talking about are flows and call outs basically that uh, you were mentioning. Also, the other question I had was uh, as far as pilots coming in with, you know, a lot of our uh, pilots are uh, low experience. So what are your thoughts on instrument skills and basic instrument skills and fundamental multi-engine skills? Well, I think that's a great question and I appreciate you asking me that. You can never know enough. I had the opportunity to uh, present a little bit of a class earlier today here at Aerostar and I was mentioning to the class my philosophy that we never stop learning. As professional aviators we're always building on our experience and our knowledge. I hope that my last flight Hopefully it will be on my 65th birthday, or the day before my 65th birthday, I guess. Um, that on my very last flight, I'm still learning something new. I'm still trying to perfect my skills and hone my abilities. We can't afford to learn material twice. We have to build on a solid foundation of knowledge. Flying an airliner is all instrument flying. When you're at 35 or 40,000 feet, that uh, flight, even though you might be in visual conditions, is a instrument flight. You're too high and the aircraft's deck angles are uh, too sensitive to speed and altitude deviations to not fly the airplane by instruments. So having solid instrument skills is absolutely critical before enrolling in a type rating program. As you fly a twin engine transport category jet with motors that can produce 27 to 30,000 pounds of thrust each, having good multi-engine flying skills, understanding engine symmetry, understanding what's going to happen to yaw when an engine fails and the secondary effects on pitch and roll all of that is built upon a strong foundation in multi-engine flying thank you very much dave i really appreciate the uh, answers to the questions please feel free to add anything else uh, again, uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, always a pleasure to be able to answer these type of questions. Our goal here at Aerostar is helping aviation career dreams take flight. And we do that by trying to present material like this. Try to connect the dots for people to make the transition from flying your very first demo flight to being a captain on a transport category jet, a seamless continual uh, learning, growing opportunity. Thank you very much, Patrick.